a Wikividi Documentaries production. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Enjoy. Newfoundland and Labrador Newfoundland and Labrador is the most easterly province of Canada. Situated in the country's Atlantic region, it comprises the island of Newfoundland and mainland Labrador to the northwest, with a combined area of 405,212 square kilometers. In 2013, the province's population was estimated at 526,702. About 92% of the province's population lives on the island of Newfoundland, of whom more than half live on the Avalon Peninsula. The province is Canada's most linguistically homogeneous, with 97.6% of residents reporting English as their mother tongue in the 2006 census. Historically, Newfoundland was also home to unique varieties of French and Irish, as well as the extinct Bugok language. In Labrador, local dialects of Inuaimun and Inatitut are also spoken. Newfoundland and Labrador's capital and largest city, St. John's, is Canada's 20th largest census metropolitan area and is home to almost 40% of the province's population. St. John's is the seat of government, home, to the House of Assembly of Newfoundland and Labrador and, to the highest court in the jurisdiction, the Newfoundland and Labrador Court of Appeal, a former colony and then dominion of the United Kingdom. Newfoundland gave up its independence in 1933, following significant economic distress caused by the Great Depression and the aftermath of Newfoundland's participation in World War I. It became the tenth province to enter the Canadian Confederation on March 31, 1949, as Newfoundland. On December 6, 2001, an amendment was made to the Constitution of Canada to change the province's official name to Newfoundland and Labrador. Etymology the name, Newfoundland, is a translation of the Portuguese Terra Nova, which literally means new land, that is also reflected in the French name for the province's island part. The influence of early Portuguese exploration is also reflected in the name of Labrador, which derives from the surname of the Portuguese navigator João Fernandes Lavrador. Labrador's name in the Inatitut language is Nunitsuic, meaning, the big land. Newfoundland's Inatitut name is Ikaramikluic, meaning, place of many shoals. Geography Newfoundland and Labrador is the most easterly province in Canada, and is located at the northeastern corner of North America. The Strait of Belle Isle separates the province into two geographical divisions, Labrador which is a large area of mainland Canada, and Newfoundland, an island in the Atlantic Ocean. The province also includes over 7,000 tiny islands. Newfoundland is roughly triangular. Each side is about 400 kilometers long, and its area is 108,860 square kilometers. Newfoundland and its neighboring small islands have a total area of 111,390 square kilometers. Newfoundland extends between latitudes 46 degrees 36 in and 51 degrees 38 in. Labrador is an irregular shape, the western part of its border, with Quebec is the drainage divide of the Labrador Peninsula. Lands drained by rivers that flow into the Atlantic Ocean are part of Labrador, and the rest belongs to Quebec. Most of Labrador's southern boundary with Quebec follows the 52nd parallel of latitude. Labrador's extreme northern tip, at 60 degrees 22 and, shares a short border with Nunavut. Labrador's area is 294,330 square kilometers. Together, Newfoundland and Labrador make up 4.06% of Canada's area, with a total area of 405,720 square kilometres. Labrador is the easternmost part of the Canadian Shield, a vast area of ancient metamorphic rock comprising much of northeastern North America. 
colliding tectonic plates have shaped much of the geology of Newfoundland. Grossmont National Park has a reputation as an outstanding example of tectonics at work, and as such has been designated a World Heritage Site. The Long Range Mountains on Newfoundland's west coast to the northeasternmost extension of the Appalachian Mountains, the north-south extent of the province, prevalent westerly winds, cold ocean currents and local factors such as mountains and coastline combine to create the various climates of the province. Northern Labrador is classified as a polar tundra climate. Southern Labrador has a subarctic climate, while most of Newfoundland has a humid continental climate, cool summer subtype climate. Newfoundland and Labrador has a wide range of climates and weather, due to its geography. The island of Newfoundland spans 5 degrees of latitude, comparable to the Great Lakes. The province has been divided into six climate types. But broadly Newfoundland has a cool summer subtype of a humid continental climate, which is greatly influenced by the sea since no part of the island is more than 100 kilometers from the ocean. Northern Labrador is classified as a polar tundra climate. Southern Labrador has a subarctic climate. Monthly average temperatures, rainfall and snowfall, for four places are shown in the attached graphs. St. John's represents the east coast, Gander the interior of the island, Cornerbrook the west coast of the island, and Wabash the interior of Labrador. Climate data for 56 places in the province is available from Environment Canada. The data for the graphs is the average over 30 years. Error bars on the temperature graph indicate the range of daytime highs and nighttime lows. Snowfall is the total amount that fell during the month, not the amount accumulated on the ground. This distinction is particularly important for St. John's, where a heavy snowfall can be followed by rain, so that no snow remains on the ground. Surface water temperatures on the Atlantic side reach a summer average of 12 degrees Celsius inshore and 9 degrees Celsius offshore to winter lows of 1 degree Celsius inshore and 2 degrees Celsius offshore. Sea temperatures on the west coast are warmer than Atlantic side by 1 to 3 degrees Celsius. The sea keeps winter temperatures slightly higher, and summer temperatures a little lower on the coast than inland. The maritime climate produces more variable weather, ample precipitation in a variety of forms greater humidity, lower visibility, more clouds, less sunshine, and higher winds than a continental climate. Pre-colonization Human habitation in Newfoundland and Labrador can be traced back about 9,000 years. The maritime archaic peoples were groups of archaic cultures of sea mammal hunters in the subarctic. They prospered along the Atlantic coast of North America from about 7000 BC to 1500 BC. Their settlements included longhouses and boat top temporary seasonal houses. They engaged in long distance trade, using as currency white shirt, a rock quarried. From northern Labrador to Maine, the southern branch of these people was established on the North Peninsula of Newfoundland. By 5000 years ago, the maritime archaic period is best known from a mortuary site in Newfoundland. At Porto Joy, the maritime archaic peoples were gradually displaced by people of the Dorset culture who also occupied Porto Joy. The number of their sites discovered on Newfoundland indicates they may have been the most numerous group of Aboriginal people to live there. They thrived from about 2000 BC to AD 800. Many of their sites were located on exposed headlands and outer islands. They were more oriented to the sea than earlier peoples, and had developed sleds and boats similar to kayaks. They burned seal blubber in soapstone lamps. Many of these sites, such as Port Ojoy, recently excavated by memorial archaeologist Priscilla Renouf, are quite large and show evidence of a long-term commitment to place. 
Renouf has excavated huge amounts of harp seal bones at Porto Troy, indicating that this place was a prime location for the hunting of these animals. The people of the Dorset culture were highly adapted to living in a very cold climate, and much of their food came from hunting sea mammals through holes in the ice. The massive decline in sea ice during the medieval warm period would have had a devastating impact upon their way of life. The appearance of the Buddha culture is believed to be the most recent cultural manifestation of peoples who first migrated from Labrador to Newfoundland around 1 AD. The Inuit, found mostly in Labrador, are the descendants of what anthropologists call the Thule people, who emerged from western Alaska around AD 1000 and spread eastwards across the high Arctic, reaching Labrador around 1300-1500. Researchers believe that the Dorset culture lacked the dogs, larger weapons and other technologies that gave the expanding Inuit people an advantage. Over time, groups started to focus on resources available to them locally. The inhabitants eventually organized themselves into small bands of a few families, grouped into larger tribes and chieftainships. The Innu are the inhabitants of an area they refer to as Nitasana, i.e. most of what is now referred to as northeastern Quebec and Labrador. Their subsistence activities were historically centered on hunting and trapping caribou, deer, and small game. Coastal clans also practiced agriculture, fished and managed maple sugar bush. The Innu engaged in tribal warfare along the coast of Labrador, with the Inuit groups that had significant populations. The MIKMAQ of southern Newfoundland spent most of their time on the shores harvesting seafood. During the winter they would move inland to the woods to hunt. Over time, the MIKMAQ and Innu divided their lands into traditional districts. Each district was independently governed and had a district chief and a council. The council members were band chiefs, elders and other worthy community leaders. In addition to the district councils, the MIKMAQ tribes also had a grand council at Sante Maui Omi which according to oral tradition was formed before 1600. Descendants of the Budducks By the time that European contact with Newfoundland began in the early 16th century, the Budduk were the only indigenous group living permanently on the island. Unlike other groups in the northeastern area of the Americas, the Budduk never established sustained trading relations with European settlers. Instead, their trading interactions were sporadic, and they largely attempted to avoid contact in order to preserve their culture. The establishment of English fishing operations on the outer coastline of the island, and a later expansion into bays and inlets, cut off access for the Budok to their traditional sources of food. In the 18th century, as the Budok were driven further inland by these encroachments, violence between Budok and settlers escalated, with each retaliating against the other in their competition for resources. By the early 19th century, violence, starvation, and exposure to tuberculosis had decimated the Budok population, and they were extinct as a cultural group. By 1829, geneticists have suggested that some Icelanders may carry Budok DNA, which has been passed down matrilineally over the centuries. This suggests that, when the Vikings abandoned their colonization of Newfoundland around 1000 AD, they might have brought back Budok women to Europe. European contact the oldest confirmed accounts of European contact date, from a thousand years ago was described in the Viking Icelandic sagas. Around the year 1001, the sagas refer to Leif Erikson landing in three places to the west, the first two being Helluland and Markland. Leif's third landing was, at a place he called Vinland. Archaeological evidence of a Norse settlement was found in Lanzo Meadows, Newfoundland, which was declared a World Heritage Site by UNESCO in 1978. 
There are several other unconfirmed accounts of European discovery and exploration, one tale by men from the Channel Islands being blown off course in the late 15th century into a strange land full of fish, and another from Portuguese maps that depict the Terra de Bacurhau, or land of codfish, west of the Azores. The earliest, though, is the voyage of St. Brendan, the fantastical account of an Irish monk who made a sea voyage in the early 6th century. While the story itself became a part of myth and legend, some historians believe it is based on fact. In 1496 John Cabot obtained a charter from English King Henry VII to sail to all parts, countries and seas of the East, the West and of the North, under our banner and ensign and to set up our banner on any new found land. And on June 24, 1497, landed in Cape Bonavista. Historians disagree on whether Cabot landed in Nova Scotia in 1497 or in Newfoundland, or possibly Maine, if he landed at all, but Bonavista is recognized by the governments of Canada and the United Kingdom as being Carbert's official landing place. In 1499 and 1500, Portuguese mariners João Fernandes Lavrador and Pero de Barcelos explored and mapped the coast, the former's name appearing as Labrador on topographical maps of the period. Based on the Treaty of Tordesillas, the Portuguese crown claimed it had territorial rights in the area visited by John Cabot in 1497 and 1498. Subsequently, in 1501 and 1502 the court real brothers, Miguel and Gaspar, explored Newfoundland and Labrador, claiming them as part of the Portuguese Empire. In 1506, King Manuel I of Portugal created taxes for the cod fisheries in Newfoundland waters. João Alvarez Fagans and Pero de Barcelos established seasonal fishing outposts in Newfoundland and Nova Scotia around 1521, and older Portuguese settlements may have existed. Sir Humphrey Gilbert, provided with letters patent from Queen Elizabeth I, landed in St. John's in August 1583, and formally took possession of the island. Brought to you by Wikividi Documentaries Would you like to know more?